I found it a great help. If you want to keep your Bibles open at Joshua uh, 5 and 6, you may also find it useful to have on the inside of the service sheet, on the back of the uh, notices, there's a little outline which shows uh, roughly where I'm going to head today. You might find that useful just to guide us through. You might want to take some uh, notes, write some questions as we focus on this part of God's uh, Word. Now friends, love it or hate it, Uh, Life is full of abbreviated words. Or, if you want the technical definition, I got very excited this week when I found the technical uh, definition. They are called initialisms. Okay, not acronyms. I was corrected when I did my research. Uh, What I mean are words like this. Uh, And I'm sure you'll be able to get some of these. BBC, which stands for? Oh, you're nervous. You're warming up. British Broadcasting Corporation. MP... Yes, or military police. Well done. Um, RSVP. Oh, well done. Look at the language skills of this congregation. are amazing today. Um, what about LOL? Well, this is what confuses me. Genuinely, I'm confused because um, often I think it doesn't mean lots of love. Or laugh out loud. Those are my two. I don't know if there's any other meanings. You don't have to tell me. But LOL. So I don't really know when someone says that to me. Are they having a laugh with me? Are they sending love to me? I'm really confused. So basically never do that for me. Just write it out. Um, What about WWJD? Oh, you do know. What would Jesus do? There was a time... When that slogan, WWJD, was really popular uh, with a number of Christians. And you would see some Christians with wristbands uh, that had those letters on it. And the idea was that uh, when you were in a complicated situation, it was to help you to think through what to do. So whenever a tricky situation presented itself, you look at your wrist, uh, you see the letters WWJD, and you go, ah, what would Jesus do if he was in my shoes? Okay, that's what people did back then. Now this morning, without commenting on the usefulness of that in real life, um, I want to apply that question, WWJD, to this part of Joshua. Now what I mean is this. What would Jesus do if he was in charge of God's people as they waited outside Jericho? The reason I ask that is because I regularly meet people, Christians, and those who are still trying to work it out, who think the God of the Old Testament is a bit of a monster. And the same people often think and like to think that Jesus is so gentle and so cuddly that he would never condone anything that is brutal or bloody. And if you believe those two things about the God of the Old Testament and that about Jesus, then you probably think that Jesus would have handled this whole Jericho situation very differently from what we read about in Joshua chapter 6. Perhaps he would have opened up the diplomatic channels. Perhaps he would have sent people in two by two to have a conversation with the people of Jericho. Maybe he would have sent in the peace envoy. But can you imagine Jesus ordering his people to completely obliterate a city? W, W, J, D. Well, the good news this morning is we don't actually have to guess what Jesus would have done in Jericho. Because what we are presented with in these chapters of the book of Joshua is exactly what Jesus commanded. And what Jesus authorised. Now in order for us to see that, I want to show you two things this morning. First of all, I want to show you Jesus the warrior in chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. And then I want to show you the battle that Jesus commanded. So first of all, let's meet Jesus the warrior. Now the whole point of this little section in chapter 5, verses 13 to 15, is to teach Joshua and us... Who the ultimate commander of God's people is. See, at this point in the story, you could be tempted to think that the commander of God's people was Joshua. 
understand there is some truth in that, but it would be an, a big mistake to conclude that Joshua was the ultimate commander of God's people. Uh, let me show you. Look at verse 13. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, and that's not Joshua saying this, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. It's not hard to work out why Joshua asked his question in verse 13. Remember, um, he was in charge of God's people and he had just met a stranger dressed for battle on the edge of the town that God's people had under siege. So it's easy to work out why he asked the question, are you for us or for our enemies? Basically, Joshua says to the stranger, whose side are you on? Are you with me or my enemies? Are you a friend or a foe? And the stranger's answer is really strange. Because he says to Joshua, who is tempted to think of himself as the commander of the Lord's army, that no, Joshua... You're not the commander of the Lord's army. I am the commander of the Lord's army. And the big question is not really, whose side am I on? The big question is much more, are you on my side? So who is Joshua talking to? Well, there is a big clue that Joshua is talking to someone who is not just special. But he's talking to someone who is utterly and completely divine. Listen again to verse 15 and see if you remember anything from the Bible story that is triggered at this point. The commander of the Lord's army says, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. Have you heard that before? Somewhere in the Bible maybe? That phrase said to someone else, sandals, holy ground. Uh, we're supposed to make the connection between what happened to Moses... And what happened to Joshua? Remember at the bottom of Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 3, that the bush that burned and didn't burn up? Moses meets God. He actually meets the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, who says to him, take off your sandals. For the place that you are standing, Moses, is holy ground. And then Joshua meets someone, and the very same thing is said. The stranger is not just special. The stranger is saying by these words that I am God. I am divine. That is who is standing before Joshua. Now who is that? Well, it must be either the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. It's got to be one of the three, one of the Godhead. So which one? Well, I think it's safe to conclude that the person meeting Joshua is the eternal Son of God, who one day will be born and who will be called Jesus. Now, why do I think that? In the Bible, it is the Son of God who is described again and again as the one sent by the Father. Now, that's his role. The Father sends the Son. And that doesn't just start in the New Testament. It's not that Jesus is kicking his heels around until, you know, he's born and goes, oh, I've got something to do. That's always his role. The Father sends the Son. Notice too, this stranger looks a bit like a human, doesn't he? Well, there is one of the members of the Godhead, one of the members of the Trinity, who one day would be born as a human being. So here you have in the Old Testament, this is not the only place. Uh, technically, if you, if you like technical words, they're called theophanies. Appearances of God. Uh, when God himself appears in the form of a human, it all anticipates the birth of Jesus, the incarnation when the Son of God would take on human flesh. But also, if you like taking notes and references, the person described here is dressed like a warrior, isn't he? With a drawn sword. Well, if you pick up your Bibles later and look at Revelation chapter 19, uh, you will see that Jesus Christ himself is described as a warrior with a drawn sword. Friends, who is the ultimate commander of God's people in the book of Joshua? Not Joshua the man, but the greater Joshua. Jesus, our God. It's incredible, isn't it? But that's who's in charge 
of God's people. So what's our question? WWJD? What would Jesus do if he was confronted with the situation in Jericho? Friends, we don't have to guess. Because Jesus is in charge of Jericho. And what you discover in chapter 6 is the battle that Jesus commanded. Now there are three things I want to point out about this battle. Jesus first tells his people to do some very unusual things. Second, his people bring justice to a wicked people. And third, his people bring salvation to repentant sinners. So let me show you first uh, the, the unusual things that Jesus commands his people to do. Have a look at uh, chapter 6 verse 3. March around, these are the battle orders of Jesus. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do it for six days. Make seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with a priest blowing the trumpets. And when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, make the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go in. Everyone straight in. So how are they to break into this fortified city? Jesus says, here's how you do it. Arrange your troops. Divide up your army. Put some of the soldiers in front. Then put seven priests next, who each have a trumpet. And then put the Ark of the Covenant. That goes next. And then put some soldiers at the rear. And what are you to do? <laughs> March around the city once a day, in formation, for six days. Then on the seventh day, march around seven times. And as the trumpets blow, everyone makes a loud noise and the walls will come tumbling down. That story is a Sunday school teacher's dream. Isn't it? There's marching, there's armies, there's trumpets. Sunday school teachers around the world love it. But it isn't just a Sunday school story. We will never find any of those tactics in any military textbook. Can you imagine any human military commander saying that to his troops? So why does King Jesus tell his army to do this? It is a public display for all who witnessed it and for all who will read about it, that's us, that it is the powerful God of heaven who ultimately brings victory for God's people on earth. That's what it's trying to say. All the tactics are designed to say it's the God of heaven, powerful, who brings victory for God's people on earth. And you see that in a number of ways. The soldiers, they don't blast the walls with anything, do they? Normally armies, they're putting siege and then the catapults get up, don't they? And they start throwing big rocks at walls. These soldiers never throw anything at the walls. And it's not just the soldiers who march around. You get the priests. You get the clergy. <laughs> and what are the clergy equipped with? They've got trumpets. And so they're trumpeting around. And what are they trumpeting for? They are to draw attention to something. The Ark of the Covenant. That's in the middle of the procession. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant is this wooden box covered in gold. And it was a symbol of God's personal presence with his people. So in the very center of this marching army is God's physical presence. Symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant. That's what the trumpets are for. Not to draw attention to the army, but to the box. To God himself. And then... Without touching the walls, God himself brings them down. The whole spectacle was designed to show us that it is the powerful God who brings victory for his people. That's what it's for. So what's the big application of that truth for us? I think it is to be reminded that our salvation is completely dependent on God providing it for us. I mean completely dependent. Don't you find it so easy in a typical week to take your eyes off the finished work of Jesus. It's a disaster for us when we do it. When you take your eyes off the finished work of Jesus, it can bring great discouragement because then you're confronted with your own sin. And you start thinking to yourself, will I be any good? Will I make it? And then you start covering up stuff. Don't take your eyes off the finished work of Jesus. Sometimes it brings pride. You take your eyes off the finished work of Jesus and you think you're having a good week spiritually. You start walking around thinking, oh, I'm doing all right at this. But usually it just brings uncertainty. And so this morning I want to press this home so that we will be reminded that it is the mighty God of heaven who has brought us victory by his mighty strength. And you might think to yourself, look at the finished work of Jesus. It's a cross. Jesus the man dies on a cross. It doesn't look very strong, does it? 
But remember that although the cross may look weak, it took the strength of Jesus' love to keep him on the cross. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. There is a secondary application, not the primary one, the secondary one. I just want to throw this out to you. This may be useful for you. Maybe the Spirit will push this on your heart this morning. Is to remember that the mighty power of God in our life means that no circumstance is outside God's control. There are many times in a typical week when the circumstances of your life and my life will threaten to overwhelm us. Now, we have no promise at all in the Bible that God will act in the way we want when we ask him to. There's no promise for that. We're told to pray, but God's in heaven and it's up to him to decide how he will act. But here is the Bible promise. The Bible promises that there is nothing hindering God from acting in the way he chooses. And he acts in the way he chooses because he loves us. So we pray, but don't think there's anything that is stopping God in your life from achieving his purposes for you. If God can knock down the walls without anybody touching them, he'll get you through. He'll get you through in the way he decides. So that's the first one. Jesus tells his people to do some very unusual things. What else? His people bring justice to a wicked people. Now, uh, the verses uh, 6 to 21 describe how Joshua and God's people put the orders of Jesus into practice. Now, the end result is described in verses 20 and 21. So have a listen to this. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed it with a sword, every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. So how are we to handle these verses? How are we to make sense of them in our heads and in our hearts? Remember, this is all part of God's word. So what we are not allowed to do is to get our scissors out and to cut out bits of the Bible we don't like. You'll be tempted. Don't do it. They're in God's word. How are we to handle them? Let me say three things. Uh, this is not the first time God has mentioned this judgment. Uh, the first time was about 400 years before this happened. Uh, when God was speaking to Abraham. And God said this in Genesis chapter 15, in the fourth generation of your descendants, they will come back here, that is to this promised land, for the sin of the Amorites has not reached its full measure. That is, God is going to be patient with the people who live in the promised land, even though they are wicked, and even though they deserve his judgment, God is patient with them for 400 years before he brings his judgment. So let me ask you this question. How long is your fuse? How long does it take you to explode with anger when people offend you or hurt those you love? How long is your fuse? Ten seconds? <laughs> Less than that. <laughs> Ten minutes? Ten hours? Ten days? God has been patient 400 years with his people. And even at this point, he doesn't just burst out with uncontrollable anger. That's not what you are reading. You're not reading about a divine temper tantrum. It is a controlled, deserved, and necessary justice. It reminds me of what we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Indeed, instead, he is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but to come to repentance. Isn't that lovely? God is patient with us. Justice will be done according to the Bible. That is right. Your heart, my heart cries out for justice. There is a coming day of justice. But now, because of God's mercy, is the time of salvation. God is patient with people. The people of Scarborough, the people of the world, with us. And this is the time of salvation. So as a result, friends, be amazed. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to turn away our, our natural instinct that is to be grumpy with God and to think God is harsh, to be amazed at God's patience with us. So be amazed at how God 
was patient with you if you were a Christian today, just be amazed at how patient God was with you before you got converted, before you were saved. Just be amazed at that. Be amazed at how patient God is with you now, if you're a Christian, as you get transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not perfect, are we? How patient God is with us. And see the opportunities. How patient God is with our friends and our families. This is the time of salvation. Are you someone who is always looking to share something of Jesus intentionally, thinking, could this be the time? Could I do this? Friends, I think that's just normal. That should be normal behavior. In the light of our retur- the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, God is patient with us. This is the time to be looking around all the time thinking, here's an opportunity. Maybe it's easy, maybe it's difficult, but that is what God's patient allows. So that's the first thing. God had been patient before this judgment. Secondly, we need to understand that this people were wicked. Uh, one of the reasons for the total destruction was to stop God's people from being contaminated with their practices. They were wicked. They burned their children in fire. God's people had to live in this land, and I'm afraid you see the consequences of God's people not doing what they were told. Because they didn't totally obliterate the nations in the land, the wicked people, and then what happened was they took on the practices of those around them. Now, the application for us is not to go and repeat the violence of the Crusades. That's not how we read our Bibles. We don't just simply read Joshua and think, oh, that's me now, isn't it? No, I read through the New Testament. I'm in the New Testament people of God. The application is never go and exterminate a people. Never. Ever. Whatever justification was used for the Crusades, it was not from the Bible. It should not have been. Instead... There is a different principle in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, which says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think about that. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. That is, do not be contaminated by the worldly view of the world around us. Live in the world, reach the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But here's, I think, what we need to do. You've got to bring this battle language to not conforming. That is, we have to radically cull the destructive trash in our lives. Let me ask you, what is the destructive trash in your life? What is the stuff in your life that is just causing you to stay a spiritual baby? We've got to have battle language, friends, to cull the destructive trash so that we grow up and mature as the people of Jesus Christ. That's the second thing. The other thing I want to say in passing is this. It's more of a theological truth. Because you will be troubled, I am sure as you read this, because of who was killed. Everyone. And you might think, what about the kids? Theologically, I want to say to you, that children go to heaven. Uh, The children killed that day would have gone straight to heaven never having to grow up in the brutal ward of Jericho. That is not a nice place to grow up. But instead, dwelling forever in the paradise of God. You need to know that. Third, what happened? The people of Jesus bring salvation to repentant sinners. This is where we end. Uh, Look at verse 22. It's amazing how it finishes. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out on all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in the place outside the camp of Israel. What a lovely story. We've already met Rahab the prostitute. We've already pondered how her inclusion is a great encouragement for us all. The mercy of God extending to to everyone who has faith. It's wonderful. But here's the new point. Just as we just as we finish there, I want to press this home. We've done some stuff before. Here's the new angle on it. What you're hearing now 
is God's promise of salvation fulfilled. He'd already said, you trust me, you're going to be safe. But now this is God fulfilling his promise. It is a wonderful reminder that the God who makes a salvation promise keeps a salvation promise. What are some of the salvation promises in the Bible? Here are a few. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What a promise that is of salvation. Do you believe it? Can we believe that God will keep that salvation promise? That whoever puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved? You bet you. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, where Paul says, I am confident of this, that the God who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Can you believe that? The God who starts a salvation work in your life will make sure he finishes it? Yeah, you can. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 2. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. So if all the way through your life, in your weakness, you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, can you be guaranteed that Christ will get you home? You bet ya. Rahab here is a wonderful reminder that the God who makes a salvation promise keeps a salvation promise. So we started with a question. WWJD. I'm afraid the old Sunday school song got it wrong. It wasn't Joshua who fought the battle of Jericho. It was Jesus who fought the battle of Jericho. Let's pray. Our dear Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for the finished work of Christ. And we pray, as we look at the world in these days before Christ returns, that we seek the opportunities to take advantage of your patience and continue to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that we rejoice today in our salvation and in the truth that you, the God who starts a great work, will make sure it continues until we arrive in heaven. And we pray that for the glory of Christ. Amen.